Hey folks, how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at how quickly and easily you can make a particle system inside a touch designer with some really dynamic and cool looking attractors and repellers. So let's go ahead and delete everything here and start again. So in this example, what I want to do is have just a field of particles and then be able to use my mouse to essentially repel or attract those particles. So let's start first with our particle system. I'm going to start by making a grid sop. And then I'm going to go ahead and do two things that I almost always do when I'm working with geometry that's going into particle systems. The first is I'm going to use a sort sop. And what this does is allows me to randomly sort all of the point numbers inside of my particle system. Now, if we don't do this step, you'll probably have experienced this before, but it looks like your particles are emitting like scan lines, just going through every single point in the geometry in order. And just by setting this point sort to random, this essentially allows us to emit points from everywhere in that particle system. So the next thing I'm going to do is create a point SOP. And this is very useful because by adjusting the normals, we can really adjust how far and how fast and how almost energetically the particles leave that grid. Now in this case, because I want that field of particles effect, and I don't actually want the particles to emit and, and kind of leave that originating area too much, what I can do is go to the add normal area, open up the normals here, and we can see we have me.input normals zero, me.input normals one and two, and those are the X, Y, Z normals. Now, one of the really fun things I can do here is just multiply these by a very small value. And what this is going to do is essentially just have the particles emit away from the grid and then just kind of hang out in this same area of that grid. So what we could do is say multiply everything by 0.01. And I'll do the same for the Y and the same for the Z normals. So this essentially shrinks the normals and the particles which use those normals for their kind of emission direction and velocity are then only going to, you know, just jump out of the grid a little bit. So with these three operators, we're now ready to create our particle SOP. And I'll hook up my point SOP to the first input of the particle. And if I right click inside of the particle, SOP, click display options and show my points, I can see all of those particles there. And you can see what I mean about normally if we didn't have this point SOP, these particles would be flying away from that grid and it would be really hard to make a really dedicated field for our interaction. So that's why we're going to re-enable our point. And what I'm going to do on the particle SOP is just go to the particles page of parameter and birth more of them. So I want a thousand particles and we can start to see this nice kind of really dense grid. I may even decide to go back to my grid SOP, increase the rows and columns to be 50 by 50. So it's even more dense. And now we're ready to essentially move into working with our attractors. Now, if you've never worked with metaballs, don't worry, they're not too complicated. We'll go ahead and make a meta ball SOP. And in Touch Designer, all of our meta balls are represented as these spheres. But one important thing to know is they're not actually spheres of geometry. They're more force fields and their force fields are represented by this kind of sphere of influence. So that's a better way to think about it. And don't think about the actual geometry that we're seeing here. Now, this meta ball is special because what we can do is apply a force to it using a force SOP. And we'll come back and start editing these fun parameters in a second. But after this, really, all we really need is a transform SOP because that's what's going to allow us to move this around with our mouse or if you want to use a connect or any other sensor. And then we can go ahead and plug this into our particle. Now, if you've never done this before and you don't know where which one of the inputs it should go into, one really nice thing you can do is just hover over the inputs and you can see a little tooltip that tells you what that input is for. So the second one is for input collisions. Third one is for input force, and that's what we want. And we can see the last one is for surface attractors. So I'm going to go ahead and plug my transform into that third input. Now, we won't really see anything yet because we haven't actually enabled our force stop to do anything. But one really nice thing we can do just to prepare the scene is on our particle SOP, we can enable this compare flag. And this is really nice because what it does is allows us to see our meta ball, our kind of sphere of influence as a kind of wireframe inside of that particle SOP's viewer. 
Now, the nice thing about this is that it doesn't actually get rendered. It's just for our kind of development viewing purposes. And I can already see that this looks like it's way too big for my scene. So I'm going to go to my meta ball here and I'm just going to grab the radius middle click on it and just drag so that all of the X, Y, and Z get smaller. And I think about 0.3 looks like it would be a nice size where I could move it around, you know, add some force and influence the particles without dragging everything all the time. So now the final thing we're going to set up here is a mouse control. Now you can do this with any kind of chop channel. It'll always be the same process and you might just have to scale your values differently. So what I'll do in this example is create a mouse in chop. And I like to set my output coordinates to normalized because that way I get a negative one to positive one in both my X and Y directions. And I'm going to put a math stop after it. Now we don't maybe know exactly what we're going to scale our values to, but I already know that I'm going to scale my values and that's why I'm going to preemptively put a math stop. And then finally I'll put a null chop here. So now on my transform stop, I can grab my TX and map that to my translate X and I can map my TY to translate Y. And now you can see as I move my mouse around that meta ball is kind of following it. Now, we want to know how much we want to scale our ranges of values by. And it looks like right now we're kind of going way outside of the range of our particle field. Now, an easy thing we can do to figure out what the range of this field is, is actually go back to our emitter source geometry. And if we middle click it, we can see our bounds are positive five and negative five in both directions. So that's really helpful information because I can go to my math chop, go to the range. And now we know that our source coordinates here are going from negative one to positive one. And then we know that we want our new coordinates to go from negative 0.5 over to 0 0.5. So now we can see as I move my mouse around, it's always contained within that particle field. Great. So now the real final thing we want to do here is actually start playing with some forces. So I'm going to go ahead and just temporarily make this particle stops the viewer bigger so we can see what's going on. And I'll start to turn on different forces. Now, one of the really fun things with the force stop is that you can mix and match different forces. So for example, I could turn on the radial force first and we can see just by default, I'm already getting a lot of cool, interesting movement here. Now this might be too much for a lot of people. And these are kind of where your creativity can kind of come into play where you can say, you know what, a one level unit of force is too much. Maybe I'll do something like 0 0.3. Maybe I want just more kind of ripples to be created as opposed to having those particles fly around like crazy. Now, another really fun thing you can do is think about positive values as attraction forces and negative values as repelling forces. So in the same way where 0 0.3 gives me a little bit of attraction, I could also change this to be negative 0 0.3. And now I get a little bit of kind of this repelling force, which could be really cool, especially if you're doing something maybe where you're projecting particles on the ground and you want to have people walk through the space and repel those particles. That's very easy to do with a system like this. Now, like I mentioned, radial force is not the only force. You know, what we can do is turn on our directional forces and maybe apply some vortex force. And you can see how that's a lot more circular and spiral than the radial force. We can turn on the axial and you can see that's kind of pulling the particles out on the Z axis. So there's a lot of different ways that you can experiment with this and get really creative very easily. So I'm going to leave this at 0 0.3 here just to get a little bit of attraction. The final thing you may want to do with this, uh, especially if you're going to render this, is I really enjoy taking these kind of particle systems and plugging them into a geometry instancing setup. So if I was going to do that here, what I would do is add a null SOP on the end of my chain. I would create a new geometry comp. And I would go inside of it and let's say delete this torus and let's make a box SOP. Don't forget to turn on the render and display flags. And I already know that because the range of my 3D scene here is already pretty small, you know, the boundaries are from negative 0.5 to positive 0.5 in both directions. So that tells me that a box that is of the size one, one and one is going to be too big for this. So I know that I want to make this pretty small, maybe 0.01 in all directions. 
And now we can enable our instancing. So I'm gonna to go to the instancing page of parameters here, turn on instancing, grab my null SOP, put that onto the default instance op parameter, and then I can just go through and start mapping parameters. So I know my translate X is going to be P0, and it's always helpful, remember that P stands for position. So P0 is X, P1 is Y, and P2 is Z. And now you can see I have this kind of 3D box grid that's getting affected by the position of my mouse on the screen. Now, there's no limit to how creative you can get with this, and if you are gonna play around with this a lot, like I said, some of the really fun things to get into are playing with different combinations of forces, as well in the particle SOP. It is a really big difference how you set these parameters. For example, if you start to turn the mass and the drag higher, the particles are gonna feel heavier and only get pulled in a little bit. You can birth more particles with a shorter lifespan just to get kind of more wispy, or you could birth less particles with longer lifespans to get a bit more kind of, of you know, longer lasting impacts of those forces. So there's a lot of things you can do with this, and this is a fun and easy technique that we've deployed on projects, and now you can too. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.